The world's worst geo-disaster is the so-called Boxing Day tsunami, which crashed into the coasts around the Indian Ocean in 2004. It's an infamous event, familiar to many people, not least because of its reworking by Hollywood. But almost 230,000 people are known to have been killed that day. It had its origins in the plate boundary that runs offshore the island of Sumatra. This is the geological story, not just of the 2004 tsunami, but also a second one that happened a few months later. Tsunamis are not single waves, they're complex, and the 2004 tsunami has provided important information on how they work. Let's go to Thailand briefly, an area really badly hit, with over 8,000 people killed, and the island group of Koh Phi Phi. On the 26th of December, the first wave arrived at 10.37 in the morning, sweeping onto the North Bay. It was followed by the main wave that swept in from the south. The north approach reduced by the backwash from wave one. The main wave swept across the low land, the narrow strip where almost all the hotels and bars were, sweeping all in its path. The run up, the maximum wave height, was over six metres. But for the really big run ups, we need to get closer to the tsunami's origin in northern Sumatra. The city of Banda Aceh, with over 300,000 inhabitants, was devastated. Look at how high the wave got on the trash side of this cement factory. Some of the wave heights around this corner of Sumatra reached over 30 metres. But of course, tsunami waves swept across the Indian Ocean. This is an animation that shows the travel times of the wave front at almost the speed of a commercial aircraft. 11 to 12 hours later, the wave hit South Africa with a height of around 1.5 metres, but it still killed two people. Just two hours tsunami travel time from Sumatra is Sri Lanka. And a tourist staying at the Triton Hotel in the southwest corner of the island recorded its impact. First, a rather small wave arrived at around 9.36, flooding the immediate hotel grounds, just creeping into the hotel itself. Then the water receded far beyond normal levels, exposing the sand and rocks normally several metres underwater. It's 10.05. 10.10 and the sea has surged back, reaching the hotel grounds, sweeping on in. This is after just three minutes of wave, eight after the seabed was exposed, and then, ten minutes later, the water receded, leaving debris everywhere. But at least this was a strong, concrete, multi-storey building. People survived here. Over 1,700 people were killed, as the tsunami waves of up to 10 metres height struck the Colombo Matara train. It's the world's worst rail disaster. And there's a devastatingly good video that goes into the forensics of this story. Across Sri Lanka, over 35,000 people were killed. In India, over 16,000 people. On the mainland, wave heights exceeded 10 metres. We can get an idea of the complexity of the tsunami waves from this animation. The waves interfere and locally amplify as they cross the ocean. Backwash and reflections around the source add others. Let's watch it again. The waves migrate out with complexity sweeping across the Indian Ocean. And seen from the west. Huge waves rip around the south coast of Sri Lanka. So what caused the tsunami? It was triggered 
by an earthquake of magnitude 9.1 to 9.2. It's the largest earthquake this century. And it's an example of a megathrust earthquake. Here, caused by the plate of the seabed of the Indian Ocean sliding beneath the so-called Sunda Plate in the island of Sumatra. The fault moved over 20 metres and ruptured the seabed, and this seabed displacement caused the tsunami, the greatest wash happening back onto the Sumatra coast. But the waves radiated out across the ocean. The array of islands and the ocean floor served to modify the waves so that as they transmit across the ocean, they can get quite varied. The higher parts making so-called rays, beams of more intense wave height. These are the waves on the open ocean. These are the recorded run-up heights as they interact with the coast. The red bars are coloured for being greater than 10 metres high. So the Boxing Day tsunamis were huge because the earthquake was large and because the causative fault ruptured the seabed deep underwater. So vast water volumes were moved. But just three months later, another part of the megathrust snapped, generating an earthquake of magnitude 8.6, and it generated another tsunami. Although the 2005 earthquake killed over 900 people, the tsunami that was generated reached a maximum height of just around 3 metres, and in Sri Lanka it was just 25 centimetres high. And this is the map of this later 2005 tsunami radiating out across the Indian Ocean. Magnitude 8.6 is a huge earthquake trigger, so why such a small tsunami? Well, the 2005 event isn't believed to have ruptured the seabed, so the displacement of the seabed was much, much less and focused in shallow water. In contrast, by rupturing the seabed, the 2004 earthquake impacted on much more of the water column. So it's about the rupture and the seabed, not just the earthquake magnitude. And potentially those ruptures are hard to forecast. Since 2005, there have been other large earthquakes along the megathrust offshore Sumatra, which have only generated small tsunamis. But of course, the 2004 earthquake wasn't just one big bang. Earthquakes like this come in swarms. And in this case, they propagated up to the north towards the Andaman Islands. This is the total slip portion for this megathrust fault event, a size popularly characterised as being the same length as the state of California. And this is the slipped area for the 2005 earthquake. So, in those few months a vast length of the plate boundary unzipped and moved. But that doesn't mean that the region won't be seeing big earthquakes again soon. There's plenty more plate boundary and those segments can go again too. It remains unclear which fault segments are prone to rupturing the seabed, a key control on the size of any tsunami, and how tsunami waves propagate through and along island chains impacts directly on their amplitude and frequency as they sweep across oceans or back onto the nearby coasts all of which affect the size of the waves when they strike the land. Since 2004, there's been vast amounts of new research and the development of much more effective detective and early warning systems, as long as these warnings can get to people along the coasts in time. Earthquakes and tsunamis are unstoppable effects of our tectonic planet. We just need to live with them better.